Okay, so um, yes, this, this is on new approaches to the measurement of um, progress. Um, it's actually... I can work this thing. Okay, that's not good. Yeah. Okay, cheers, thanks. It's actually a summary of two papers, or at least it draws on two papers. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about the, f the first one, which is um, the measurement of well-being and progress, which is work with Paul and Anne and Alistair Gray. I'm also going to make some reference to work which I I'm actually not directly involved with, but which is part of the same project and is closely related by um, Gordon Anderson, Leo, uh, uh, and Anand again. Okay, so I'll give a brief introduction. Um, I'll discuss the theoretical framework that we're going to draw on for when we consider these issues. And then a very large part of the presentation really is, is on introducing a data set. We've, we went out and collected some data. Um, we'll discuss some new techniques uh, that, that are suitable for analyzing data such as this, um, provides a taste of some results, and then wrap up with some conclusions. Okay, so, well, I think it's fair to say there's not yet a consensus on how precisely human well-being should be measured. Um, but there are some guiding principles which are beginning to get some you know, begin to be generally accepted, I think. Um, and the first really is multidimensionality. I think, you know, from, from Omar Desen through to the Alcaran Foster approach, through to more recent work by Benjamin et al., and so on and so on, it's becoming, you know, really widely, I think it's, a, it's fair to say it's a new paradigm, really, that the multidimensional approach is essential. Um, there's also a growing, need, a growing recognition, I think, of a need for subjective measures, um, Sub things that which reflect not only objective conditions but also the subjective experiences that people have. And, I mean, just as one sort of example of that, uh, you know, something like affluence and technological progress, from an, a purely objective point of view, they might be seen as being unambiguously good things. Uh, but whenever you, if you, you, know, whenever you uh, bring in more subjective things, it's possible that, that, that the, the sorts of changes that arise, let's say, in a development process might give rise to social isolation, depression, and so on and so forth. So by going out and collecting more subjective data, we might learn things that we otherwise wouldn't have known, uh, which might have implications for, for policy intervention. So uh, this, these are really the sort of things that we have in our mind uh, as a framework for this, this project. So we discussed the development of a suite of indicators of well-being. At a theoretical level, our approach draws very closely on SEN's contributions to the foundations of welfare economics, but we also, to, to, to some extent, draw on the life satisfaction literature. We developed data sets for the US and the UK. Now, this has seemed very much as being a pilot study, so um, all of the empirical results are, are, are seen as being tentative in a way. Um, but the idea really is to illustrate a framework that could be rolled out potentially on a wider scale via national statistical offices and so on. We did illustrate how data such as these might be analyzed um, with, uh, with reference to two new techniques. So SEN's capabilities approach, and especially in his 1985 um, formulation in commodities and capabilities, has three, three sort of core, core equations in it. Firstly, the transformation of resources into what he refers to as functioning, so activities and beings. Secondly, the production of what we might call experienced utility, uh, which, you know, although happiness and life satisfaction and so on all have slightly different connotations, it could be viewed as, uh, it could be viewed with this aspect of Sen's approach of having something in common with the life satisfaction literature. So we're going to discuss that. Um, and then finally, and most distinctively of the approach, of course, the activities that a person is able to engage in, given their resources and personal characteristics or their capabilities. So um, our, just to outline our theoretical framework, our, you know, our, our sort of version of Sen's approach, if you like, um, person I, oh dear, sorry, um, oh dear. Okay, I'll forget about that. Uh, person I is uh, endowed with a vector of resources and a vector of personal characteristics, and they can use their endowments to achieve activities or functionings. They then have, um, and, and those functionings you know, are produced from the, their resources and personal characteristics. So functionings might be just you know, things people do, uh, playing games, or it might be, you know, or, or, or sort of the person that they are, if you like. Um, 
person. I, the second uh, part being that they derive experienced utility um, from the various activities and states that they engage in, and again, on some person-specific characteristics. And then finally, they have... Uh, and you know, our notation here is a, a little bit of a departure from Sam. Sam talks about a capability set. Here we're going to, in, in, a, sort of in a bid really to make it more empirically um, operationalizable, we're thinking of capability. We're going to talk, discuss vectors of capabilities, where each capability is the level of attainment that someone has. Not the level of attainment, but perhaps the, the, the ability to attain something in a particular dimension of well-being. So opportunities, freedoms and so on. Our objective really is to illustrate how this the theoretical framework could be applied in empirical work. So in 2011, we went out and collected, we implemented population surveys um, in both the US and the UK. And in each country, these were, these were broadly, broadly um, representative um, in terms of social class, age, gender, and so on. They were just pilot studies, as I say. We have about a, just over 1,000 individuals in the US and just under 1,700 in the UK. Our surveys captured all three aspects of the capabilities approach, as I've just described it. Um, experienced utility, with various measures of life satisfaction and happiness. In this presentation, I'm going to use life satisfaction. Um, various kinds of capabilities, which I'll, I'll say something about in a moment, and functioning as participation. Um, our main life satisfaction question, which we'll, we'll use just for the record, is uh, please rate on a scale of 0 to 10, um, where 0 indicates the lowest rating you can give and 10 the highest. Overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? So for something you know, that's been quite widely used in the literature. For capabilities, um, which there's, there's you know, much less consensus on, I suppose, we tried to address the opportunities and constraints that people face in a number of different domains. And... I mean, this was, we, we, we drew on quite heavily um, Nussbaum and Sands' work in this regard, and also some previous work of, of my co author, Paul and Anne. Um, and we covered you know, five domains so, home, home and domestic and family life, that the workplace, the local community, the local environment, and access to services. And each domain, each of these, four, of these five broad domains, there were a number of different subdomains. Um, and and uh, each question, again, was on a scale of zero to 10 ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And in total, we captured 29 capabilities across these five broad domains. Now, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I would like to give a flavor for the sorts of questions that we ask nevertheless. So, so I'm going to go through two of the domains. Um, firstly, home. So these are the questions that people were asked, again, to what extent they, they agreed with them. I'm able to share domestic tasks within the household fairly. I'm able to socialize with others in the family as I would wish. I'm able to make ends meet. I'm able to achieve a good work-life balance. I'm able to find a home suitable for my needs. I'm able to enjoy the kinds of personal relationships that I want. And I have good opportunities to feel valued and loved. Then in the workplace, um, I'm able to find work when I need to. I'm able to use my talents and skills at work. I'm able to work under a good manager at the moment. I'm always treated as an equal. I'm not discriminated against by people at work. I have good opportunities for promotion or recognition at work. And I have good opportunities to socialize at work. I can say more about the, the other domains if, if anyone asks later. I've got them all here. But um, essentially, we, so we collected a wealth of data on, on a whole range of different capabilities, covering a lot of different aspects of life. So that's, that's the data set, or a, a quick summary of the data set. We also included you know, many of the usual sorts of variables that you expect to pick up in a, in a household survey on age, gender, um, uh, geographical region, et, et, et cetera, et cetera, marital status, unemployment, um, and so on. So how might we, we, we you know, use all this, this sort of data? Well, there's, of course, there's all sorts of ways that this, that this kind of data could be analyzed, that it could be put to all sorts of uses. So I just want to give really um, some very brief ideas about it. Um, with so many different dimensions, uh, I suppose really there have been two broad approaches in the literature. One is the sort of dashboard approach where uh, you know, each, each, each dimension is taken, you know, considered in its own right and considered as being you know, intrinsically important and on its own merit. 
And then secondly, there's the, the index approach. And, you know, there have been, of course, advocates of both, both these approaches. We're going to give a, an, you know, an example of, of each approach or of something which is consistent with each of those approaches. Um, in, in a very nice recent contribution, Gaston Jalanetsky provided um, multidimensional stochastic dominance conditions for ordinal variables such as these. So when these conditions hold, you know, as usual with um, stochastic dominance, we're able to make unambiguous judgments about well-being uh, using, you know, for a broad range of well-being or welfare functions and without the need to impose any specific functional form or any specific cardinal scale. Um, and and this is, this is, you know, I think this is a really nice, a nice paper of, of Gaston because um, before that, of course, you know, stochastic dominance has been used so widely in income and so on. But all of the, uh, uh, the, there was this issue with cardinal scales with ordinal variables and none of the um, traditional statistical tests are valid and so on. So this is very nice. But we've got a lot of dimensions here. And we've also you know, not got a huge sample size. Even in very big samples and with just a very small number of dimensions, it can be difficult to obtain statistically significant results between groups using, you know, with multidimensional stochastic dominance. So we therefore, for this paper, derived um, univariate conditions, which are um, analogous to those of, of Jalanetsky. We derived the conditions and tests for first and second order stochastic dominance for ordinal variables and, uh, and applied those. Um, so, I mean, they should look, I guess, you know, fairly familiar to a lot of people. Um, the, first, the first condition, we're supposing that we have um, big S categories. So, for example... For life satisfaction, S would be 11. We've got a scale from, from 0 to 10. Um, so the, the first order of stochastic dominance being the, the, uh, the difference in the cumulative distribution functions um, between the two groups for, for each K is less than or equal to 0. Um, for all, for all well-being functions or all utility functions, if you like, that satisfy a, a simple, you know, an ordinal version of a, of a weak monotonicity condition. And then for second order stochastic dominance, um, of course, you know, a more restrictive version where the utility function or well-being function satisfies a kind of a concavity condition. So uh, I'll not go through the, through the tests and so on, but basically that's what we, we're going to use um, so that we can compare uh, dimension di by dimension, for example, for a particular capability question that we looked at. The second approach, which and this is the paper by Anderson et al. that I'm not directly involved in, but they've... they've uh, um, Created a multi-dimensional, a new multi-dimensional index of well-being, um, uh, which can also be, you know, tweaked as a as a deprivation index, and the the I mean, it's quite useful for, for data such as this. I mean, really, the uh, the, ra the the rationale for for that paper and for that index is that um, it's well very much led to the statistical problems associated with very large numbers of dimensions and even sometimes relatively small numbers of dimensions and the constraints and the demands that that puts on the data, sometimes known as the curse of dimensionality. Um, and really, it, it arises from two related issues. Firstly, the fact that intuitively similar points in k-dimensional space become further apart as k increases, and that the density surfaces become flatter. So essentially, this means that it becomes more and more difficult to distinguish between the two distributions, Essentially, mass at the center of the distribution empties out, if you like, as dimensions increase. Um, and and the, the, as I say, the flattening of distributions makes it hard to distinguish between them. So one solution to that, and, uh, and something which, of course, has been, uh, you know, with Al Al the Alcar and Foster approach and so on in uh, the depri multidimensional deprivation literature, is um, to impose additive separability. Um, and this, 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 uh, you know, this solves a lot of problems in terms of the curse of dimensionality from a statistical perspective. It does, however, make um, quite a strong normative theoretical judgment, depending on how it's, how it's implemented, at least. Um, and that being uh, that there's you know, generally no comp complementarity between different dimensions of well-being in an additively separable approach. And a lot of contexts, we, you know, we, you know, we might, of course, think that there might be quite strong complementarities between complementarities between different dimensions. So uh, I'm, I don't have too much time to go through this in detail, but essentially what um, Anderson et al. do is they, they take a sort of a compromise where they assume that the well-being measure is weakly separable into some H number of uh, 
of uh, different groups. So what? For, so h being less than. So there's big k numbers of, you know, total numbers of dimensions analyzed. For some h less than k, it can be weakly separated as follows, uh, where at each z i, um, there's a there's a vector of distinct elements such that the sum of all of those z i's is equal to k. Um, then for each of those z i's in turn, and each of these f i z i's. A fairly recent paper by Anderson, Crawford, and Lester is applied um, to basically provide an aggregate well-being index. You know, for, so that's for one of these. Um, so, so you could interpret this as being, let's say, for one sort of broad domain of well-being. Um, and this step assumes only that well-being is non-decreasing and weakly quasi-concave with respect to each argument. So therefore, um, complementarities are allowed there. Um, and then secondly... Well, uh, the Anderson et al. paper that I'm describing um, imposes something along the lines uh, of a well-being function as follows. So essentially, um, it's a quadratic form which permits, with um, a, neg a negative definite matrix, um, permits uh, a situation where well-being is non-decreasing in the arguments of f and w is concave. Well-being is concave in the arguments of f. So essentially, complementarities are allowed. So... The fact that the, the total number of, of dimensions k is reduced to a smaller number, it buys a lot of um, advantages statistically, uh, but yet um, without going as far as imposing additive separability and losing out on the complementarities. So um, I'm not sure how, how much time do I have left? <laughs> five minutes. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. So I'm just going to give a taste of, of um, some results uh, you know, for, that we have from these, from these data sets. Firstly, on race and gender, our small sample results, and this is using the, the stochastic dominance, the univariate stochastic dominance techniques that, that I mentioned, that there is evidence of significant gender and racial disparity in the U.S. across a broad range of indicators. So whites are found to, to dominate non-whites, at second order at least, in all of the domains that we looked at. Um, whites first order stochastic dominate um, in terms of environmental capabilities with a high significance. And second order stochastic dominate um, in capabilities in the community domain, um, the access to services domain, and also in the more traditional household income domain. Um, there's also evidence of significant um, gender disparities in the US, where males first order stochastically dominate females in most domains, not usually significantly so, though that could be a sample, a sample size thing. Um, but second order stochastic dominate um, significantly in both the home and household, home capabilities and in household income. In the UK, uh, we have a much smaller uh, sample of non-whites, so we struggle to get, or it may well be the reason at least why we struggle to get statistically significant results there, but we do, um, we do nevertheless find that, that whites have higher levels of well-being within the sample, um, albeit not statistically significantly so than non-whites. In terms of gender disparities in the UK, it's much more of a mixed picture than in the US. And in, in our sample, uh, in fact, females dominate males in more cases than not, but not statistically significantly so. The one statistically significant result is in household income, where males, um, males well, marginally significantly first order stochastically dominate females. We also, uh, as a, you know, uh, ran a number of life satisfaction regressions. Now, there's really not time to go into the details, but w what, I would, what, what I wanted to say was that in our, we firstly ran baseline regressions that, on life satisfaction that include all the sort of usual suspects in the literature on life satisfaction. So we have um, income, health, uh, either uh, uh, being married or having a partner, all has been significantly and positively related to life satisfaction. Unemployment being negatively related, significantly negatively related, very strongly significantly. Um, and we also find evidence of the, you know, the, the widely observed U-shaped relationship between life satisfaction and age, which has been described as uh, um, a midlife crisis and which, um, which, which Andrew Oswald and various others have found to be true in great apes. Uh, there's, al there's also a bit of a literature on whether or not the, 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 uh, the U-shape is an artifact at the moment. There's a small literature on that. But it in any case, we, we observe it in the data. What happens then is that we add in our various indicators of capability, or uh, you know, in, 
and for a lot of different specifications. But essentially what we find when we do so, and especially certain capabilities related to the home and the workplace, we find that a lot of the usual uh, variables that are significant in life satisfaction and regression has become insignificant. So notably income, uh, being married or having a partner, and also much less significance uh, and much less size as well for the, um, the U-shaped relationship with age. So an, inter an interpretation of this, what we think is that the development of certain capabilities might act as important transmission mechanisms via which higher income and living in stable relationships can boost life satisfaction. And similarly, uh, capability variables might be shedding some light on the specific factors, or they might be able to shed some light on some of the specific factors associated with the you know, midlife crisis, let's say. And also, the, uh, there, you know, there are various you know, econometric points and so on to discuss, in the, in all, as in all life satisfaction regressions. But certainly, the, you know, there are very dramatic increases in, in the R squared values when you add in even just a couple of, of capabilities. Uh, and also, they're greatly preferred by information criteria. So in conclusion, just to wrap up, we've developed novel data from the US and the UK corresponding to the capability approach concepts. Um, uh, there's a couple of new techniques, dashboards, dashboards and indices. Home and workplace capabilities um, seem to be quite important in life satisfaction regressions. Finally, we, uh, uh, just to emphasize, we see this very much as not really something about these small sample empirical results, but something that could be rolled out on a wider scale via national statistical offices. Thank you very much.